So anyway, thank you to the Depelgen Center, thank you uh, Children's Center, and thank you to Blue Willow Books. <laughs> there are a lot of you here, that's so nice, so thanks. Um, so uh, let me just start by saying, uh, we all know that there is no shortage of books when you walk into the bookstore about how we can change and mold and influence our kids. I mean, I look at that bookshelf and I sort of need a beta blocker. There's just so much there. You know, there's, there's how to raise an eco-friendly kid and how to raise a gluten-free kid and how to raise, this is not a joke, this is an actual, a disease-proof kid, which I found slightly tasteless as a title, um, and a science-minded kid and a financially savvy kid. There's so many titles up there. How to, a bilingual kid, if you live in a monolingual home. Um, there's so much up there. What there isn't, really, is any book that I could find that talks about how kids mold and shape and influence their parents. And that is the book that I wanted to read and it's the book that I decided to write. Um, this book grew out of a story that I wrote in 2010 for New York Magazine. Um, what I did in that particular story was I interrogated this very robust, very counterintuitive finding in the social sciences. This is not a one-off. This is a con this is a consistent finding, and it's very unusual, or it's very it's very um, strange when it first hits the ear, which is that kids do not seem to improve their parents' happiness. Um, that in fact they might even compromise it in some instances. And when I read that, I thought, really? That it seemed. I guess it seemed plausible, but it also seemed like it was very wrong. So um, the most canonical, the, the study that you guys might have heard of because it became an instant classic, and it's the most cited in the genre. It's really kind of wild. Um, it was done here in Texas. Daniel Kahneman, a Nobel Prize winning psychologist who essentially pioneered the field of behavioral, psycho of, uh, behavioral economics, he interviewed 909 working Texas women about how they spent their day. And he asked them to rate how they enjoyed what they were doing over the course of their day. And, and it was a fairly complex kind of emotional scale that he was asking them to engage. He was saying, were you bored while you were doing this thing? Were you unhappy? Were you um, excited? Were you enthusiastic? Were you depressed? You know, there was a big range. And at the end, when looking at the results, caring for their kids came in 16th out of 19th out of the things that they did over the course of the day. So things that clocked in higher were things like vacuuming <laughs> and responding to email and na napping. Like losing consciousness was actually more appealing. <laughs> so uh, I took one look at this and I went, OK. Um, I decided right then and there that I was going to do a deep dive into all the literature on this stuff. And it's not all in one place, just FYI. I mean, this is what's so maddening about trying to write this book in reverse. I had to dive into silos like about psychology, about sociology, about anthropology, economics, history, philosophy. I was looking at everything, trying to figure out what data there was that talked about how kids affect their moms and dads and not the other way around. And also to look at this at every stage of a uh, kid's life. I mean, because how a two-year-old affects you is obviously very different from how a 15-year-old does. So that was the first thing I wanted to do. The second thing that I wanted to do was bring this all to life in people's homes, because otherwise this stuff is dry as nails. I wanted to see this in living rooms, and in, uh, dull as nails, rather. I wanted to see this in living rooms and in carpools. I also thought that if I spent enough time with families, they would give me a sense of where to look for stuff in the research, that you know I couldn't just go on the research alone, that I might eventually start seeing patterns. So I went up to Minneapolis because Minneapolis has this amazing program for parents of kids between the ages of zero to five. 90,000 of them pass through this program every year. So you could just automatically draw a very respectable sample from there. I came down here because it is booming demographically. You guys have tons of families with kids under the age of 18 in Houston and the surrounding suburbs and you are changing demographically. There's a big population shift, so I thought it was really interesting. There's a little bit in New York, but I frankly didn't want to spend too much time in New York because although I am from New York and I love New York and I love New Yorkers dearly, I think we can all agree that New York parents are crazy. <laughs> and I therefore had to be very careful. 
So, what did I find? Um, well, this finding is like both right and wrong. I mean, that's really the answer. It is both very right and it's very wrong. Something is obviously slipping right through the sieve of social science if somehow these studies are not telling us about the moments of transcendence we get with our children, those moments of unrivaled awe that are akin to the kind of religious feelings we have. Um, something's missing from these studies if they're not telling you about the meaning and purpose and structure to your life that kids give you. Here's a fact. Um, you are much less likely to take your own life as a parent than a non-parent. Worth considering. And, this, a study doesn't ref and these studies obviously aren't reflecting something as deeply profound as that. We have earthly ties that bind. Exactly. <laughs> Couldn't have said it better. So there's that. And then, all right, so what are the studies picking up on, though? Uh, well, stuff that might be hard to say, right? That maybe there's more boredom and more anxiety and more stress involved in parenting than people uh, feel comfortable talking about. I mean, yeah. And so, you know, there's, and I think that we have to consider that. Um, so I think that the best way to summarize this is really to say, that parents experience, um, th that parenting is high cost and high reward. That they, and, and actually, I should say this, um, the most recent study that tried to engage this question, I thought did the best job, and it had the largest sample. It was Gallup, 1.5 million people responding. And what the researchers found is that parents experience more highs and more lows. They are recruiting from a bigger emotional range. And to me, that makes, by far, the most intuitive sense. So um, the high rewards I'm going to talk about, as far as uh, children being high cost, I want to say one thing. Sometimes this body of literature, you know, that kids don't necessarily improve their parents' happiness, it gets summarized in a very glib and really grim way that I hate, which goes something like this. Kids make you miserable. And I don't think that's true. I think that something about parenting right now, at this particular moment in time, is the problem. And I think that parenting has changed in three ways that are very significant that I want to talk about here. Um, before I do, two caveats. Number one, um, some of you might have already read my book, and for those of you who haven't, it's not an advice book. It is descriptive, it's not prescriptive. So if you squint, you'll probably see what seems to work and what doesn't. And, which parents who are doing things, you know, who the happier parents might be and what they're doing. But I don't offer advice. This is intended to be ethnographic. You're looking at a snapshot in time, how we parent now. The other thing is I don't write about poor parents or rich parents in this book. Poor parents, the problems of poverty and the problems of parenting are inseparable. You can't do it. You know, they're going to run right into one another. And that, that subject deserves like 20,000 books. I can't do that. Um, also, rich parents, I also sliced out because they have more resources to throw at things that I think more you know, middle class parents are struggling with. They can outsource a lot of the hardest stuff, like middle of the night duty. And they're not as, you know, they're not as worried about, like, well, if I sign up my kids for x, y, and z, then how do I pay for a, b, and c? So I wanted to keep it sort of as close as I could to the middle of the middle of the bell curve. It's not always possible, but I tried. Anyway, let me now talk about the three ways that I think that parenting has significantly changed that are sort of confounding all of us at this moment. The first one, choice. Sounds simple, but it's so uh, profound. Um, in the Plymouth colonies, most uh, families averaged eight children. Uh, in 1850, they averaged five. Now we average two. So you have to imagine how much weight we are assigning to each child and how much weight we are assigning to the value of parenting. It means something else if you only have two kids. I mean, this is going to mean a lot more to you. They are a lot more precious. You know, we don't have kids dying at birth, you know, and during childbirth, almost, I mean, seldom ever now. And, what we sell, and our infant mortality rates are very low. We don't have kids dying of childhood diseases in the same way. We really stake a lot on the one or two or three children that we have now. So there's that. Um, we also space them apart according to our needs, something we were never able to do until the advent of birth control. Um, 
we are deferring child rearing. The, if you have a college education and you're a woman, the odds are that you have had your first kid at 30.3 years old. That is a lot of years of autonomy before having a baby. So I want to point something out. Um, one of my favorite lines ever by Irma Bombeck, when she wrote, she was this great wicked satirist of domestic life. I'm sure many of you know her. She spoke to my mother's generation, but she had this great line. Um, I haven't been alone in the bathroom since October. <laughs> so like imagine, right, I mean, so true. And so like imagine now you've had like eight years of autonomous living and suddenly you have not been alone in the bathroom since October. It's a very, very striking and startling switch. That's, okay, so that's the first change. I think we can agree choice uh, when we space our kids apart and how many we have, blah, blah, blah. Number two, um, parenting has changed because our work lives have changed. We work different now. It used to be that if you got all capital letter messages in the middle of the night from your boss, that meant you were an ER doctor, right? That's the only explanation. And now we, you know, most middle class parents, if they're working, get them with striking regularity, intruding on their time all the time. And that's hard because it means that if we can work all the time, we can feel guilty all the time. <laughs> and it means perversely, and I can't tell you how often this came up, um, we often are in this weird position where we feel like our kids are interrupting us while we're doing our email, and not that our email is interrupting us when we're with our kids. And every parent I know talks about this and how guilty they feel about it. And the fact is, it's often easier to focus on your email because it's emotionally neutral and because uh, it, it allows you to kind of build a head of steam and you know kind of build some flow whereas if you have very young kids young kids don't aren't focused they're neurologically designed not to be focused they are taking in as much stimuli as possible they are like bugs with eyes all over their heads so your job is to focus them but email you can just be like a cyclops you can just focus on it so that's a big deal the other way that work has changed is that obviously more women are doing it now so, and there was a point last year, I guess, where women's workforce participation actually exceeded those of men. So, even though women have been working for many, many years, we still do not have a script for how the division of labor works out in the house under these circumstances. And it is the source of the greatest domestic tension. If you ask couples with kids what it is that they fight about, it's chores. That's like the number one thing. It's not sex, it's not their friends, it's not annoying habits. It's who does what. And we are still reckoning with this. And mathematically, it's, um, it looks fair on paper. Because men and women essentially work the same number of hours. Men work more paid, women work more unpaid. The problem is that because women work some unpaid hours, I'm sorry, work some paid hours, they come home and they want their house to be a haven, but instead they feel like the shot clock is still ticking. Women do more deadline sensitive stuff. They feel like they've got to get the food on the table by six, and they've got to get the bath running, and they've got to check the homework, and they've got to get the kids in bed. According to the American Time Use Survey, women still spend twice as much time on housework and childcare as men. So even if they are working, they then come home, and there's all this, <laughs> and there's all this, you know, stuff that they're doing. Um, and their time is much more fractured. They multitask more than men. In fact, men, when they are at home, are much less likely to be multitasking. They are, in fact, <laughs> monotasking. And if, in fact, my favorite, one of my favorite little factoids from one of these studies, UCLA trained the, like video cameras on 32 different middle class families and just watched them for 1,500 hours. It was like social science meets reality television, basically. And the, <laughs> the most common configuration they found was a man alone in a room. <laughs> and I don't think that that's a bad thing. I, I think women are really shy about taking their leisure prerogatives. Like, what would happen if we went alone in a room and said, I'm out of here, I'm reading a book? I bet our husbands would kick in. I bet they would. They just feel more entitled to it. They're OK with it. Um, and so, but I do love that very much. Anyway, so the third thing, um, and this is really the biggest change is uh, the role of the child has changed dramatically. And it's for the good, but it's thrown everything into upheaval. Until not that long ago, kids worked. 
that's just the simple fact of the matter. Not until the Progressive Era, which was essentially, let's say, 1890 to 1920, did they not work. That was when we realized that, that kids had rights and it was deeply unethical to make children work. But when kids worked, and this was starting from the very inception of our country, generally on our farms and then later in much more Dickensian situations and mills and factories and mines and things like this, um, the one thing that could be said about this arrangement is that there was reciprocity within the family, that the family made some kind of economic sense. It was economically rational. You as a parent provided food, clothing, shelter, moral instruction, whatever it is, and in return your kids kicked back into the family till so that kids were capital assets. They didn't cost you money. And now, thank God, we've changed that and we protect them, and we should, but they're now very expensive to us. They have gone essentially from being our staff to being our bosses. They control, we are now going broke on their behalves. Their new work is soccer practice and kitty gymboree and a lot of homework that we were asked to check by their schools. That's their new productive function. That's a second job. That's more work for us. That's double the work. And again, please don't think I'm pining for the days of child labor. I'm just saying we're still figuring this out. This is a lot to bear. It's a lot to do. There's no script for this. And there's not a whole lot of support outside our own homes either. You know, we don't live in Europe, so we're not going to have subsidized daycare and, you know, free health care and all that stuff. But we also are losing, like, communities are eroding. We don't have the same strength of, na our neighborhoods are not as strong anymore. We don't see our neighborhoods as frequently anymore. Churches are one of the last readouts of kind of, you know, community bolstering, and they are the source of a lot of strength for a lot of the families in this book, including a woman who's sitting in the audience, who I will not point to, but she's here, and she's a wonderful character in here. So. I think this is something to really bear in mind. Um, as an ancillary thing, I just should point out, um, so <laughs> a sociologist very ruthlessly described the child's transformation. She said that the, ch the child had became economically useless but emotionally priceless. And I think, I know, it's very harsh. It's not how I would choose to say it. But I think the point is that we now are very aware of our kids' um, self-esteem and their confidence. And that wasn't a concern in the 19th century. That's a concern now. Happiness generally is only a 20th century concern. So I would just want to stipulate something, which is that being responsible for your kid's happiness is very stressful. And it's hard on you, and it's hard on your kid. And it might be elusive. Dr. Spock, who is the mid-century child-rearing guru, and probably the only person that all of your parents consulted, he, no less than he, said, this is an elusive aim and I'm not sure that it's the best one because it's not the same as teaching your kid how to plow a field, how to chop some wood, how to even ride a bike. Teaching happy, I mean, happiness is great as a byproduct of something, right? But as an aim unto itself, it is very hard to teach. So I, there was this one woman named Angelique who I interviewed who I've just never forgotten. She was out in uh, Missouri City I was asking her, she had five kids, and I was asking her what the hardest thing was, and I thought she was going to tell me making ends meet, you know, my mortgage, or finding time to be with my husband, or, you know, having 30 minutes alone to take a bath. I, I didn't know. And her answer was, the hardest thing, well, I have this one kid who's not as happy as my other kids. And I really want to be on top of that. I really want to make sure that I can always anticipate how this kid's going to feel. I feel like that's what a good mom would do. A good mom would know and be on top of that and know the emotion. She was really beating herself up for being an inadequate emotional seismograph for her child. That's hard. That's really hard. You know, Some kids might not be happy or as happy as your other kids. It just might not be. You can try. Um, I'm now going to read little bits of my book. Um, as I said, this book, or I, I don't know if I said this, my, my book is organized chronologically. It's every stage, you know, how, how you, kids zero to five affect you, how they affect your, auto, your sense of autonomy in your marriage, how kids in the kind of six to 12 year range affect you, how adolescents affect you. This is from the early, early, early years. This is the transition to parenthood and what it feels like having gone from you know, a paragon of self-determination 
to being a person who cannot be alone in the bathroom. Um, so this is a woman named Jessie in Minnesota. We're in her kitchen. The kids head out to the dining room while we remain in the kitchen. All is quiet for a little while, but a few minutes later, as we walk through the dining room to Jessie's office, we see Abe, we see Abe that's her three-year-old, um, place a Play-Doh set onto a blob of yogurt. Abe, no, Jessie says, lunging quickly to avoid a gloppy mess. Too late. Everything off the table until I wipe it up, okay? It's the first time I've heard tension creep into her voice all morning. She's so calm one almost forgets that life with small children is a long-running experiment and contain bedlam. She wipes the yogurt silhouette away, then stops for a brief second, staring at a constellation of Cheerios and crackers behind William's high chair, which he'd obviously been tossing behind him earlier that morning. Should she even bother cleaning it up? The kids are about to embark on another grubby project in any way, rolling Play-Doh hot dogs all over the dining room table. Eh, later, she decides, and continues into her office. I should point out that Jessie had no kids until she was 32, and then she had three in rapid succession. So at 37, she now had three kids under the age of five in her house. And she had gone from being this like free-spirited person who had waited tables in England and been a flight attendant and had a career in advertising to having a home-based business, taking photographs of other families and stuff. And she's great at it. But man, was she still reeling. Um, so I'm just going to continue with this section just a bit longer. In his 2005 collection of essays, Going Sane, Adam Phillips, a psychoanalyst, writes beautifully, <laughs> makes a keen observation. Babies may be sweet, babies may be beautiful, babies may be adored, he writes, but they have all of the characteristics that are identified as mad when they are found too brazenly in adults. He lists those characteristics. Babies are incontinent. They don't speak our language. They require constant monitoring to prevent self-harm. They seem to live the excessively wishful lives, he notes, of those who assume that they are the only person in the world. <laughs> the same is true, Phillips goes on to argue, of young children who want so much and possess so little self-control. The modern child, he observes, too much, of this, too much desire, too little organization. Children are pashas of excess. If you've spent most of your adult life in the company of other adults, especially in the workplace, where social niceties are observed and rational discourse is generally the coin of the realm. It requires some adjusting to spend so much time in the company of people who feel more than think. When I first read Phillips's observation about the parallels between children and madmen, it so happened that my son, three at the time, was screaming from his room, I don't want to wear pants. <laughs> I mean, who does, really? But he, he, <laughs> that is the only appearance in this book of my son. I just wanted everybody to remember. I'd said it in the introduction. I wanted to remind everyone that I was a mother and that I was writing from a place of knowing, not from a place of not knowing. Um, this next section, um, or this tidbit, it's a little shard, is um, I just liked it. It's an argument between a husband and a wife. Uh, it's still the early years. It's a very recognizable argument between this couple named Angie and Clint. They are the loveliest people you'll ever meet. She, was, she worked nights as a psychiatric nurse. He worked the morning shift at the Minneapolis St. Paul, like budget Avis rent, our, rent a car counter. They were both really working hard, taking care of their kids when they weren't on their own shifts. They were super nice. But I chose this because Angie is a study in maternal guilt. She beats herself in, up in a way that I kept seeing over and over again. And then I finally read a little data point that I thought kind of captured it all. Men and women were both asked to uh, pretend their brains were a pie chart and to divide it up. How much of you is a parent? How much of you is a worker? How much of you is a hobbyist? How much of you is a religious person? How much of you is a spouse? Just to divide it up into the essential pieces of your identity. And women, whether they worked or not, always had a, a, a mom piece that was twice the size of the dad piece, at least. It's a, it takes up an enormous amount of psychological energy, being a mother. And there's a lot of um, that's been written also, that's been quantified but through data, about women 
thinking more about their kids, planning more of their kids' doctor's appointments and social things and all this stuff. So, and being more alive to the essential emotional undercurrents in the house, which Angie de definitely was. So, on the morning that I show up, Angie is so sick of night duty that she's just making Clint do it. She's had it up to her eyeballs, and she's like, that's it. You are getting up with the kid. I can't do it anymore. So I show up the next day at 8.25 to see how it all worked out. Clint, who has the day off, tells me that his evening duty went very well and that the kids slept until 7.30. It is only when Angie comes downstairs a few minutes later, showered, lovely, and wearing a cheerful Yoohoo t-shirt, that the picture shifts. Zay, that's their one-year-old short for Xavier, she reports, was up five times. Clint handled the first four episodes, but she got the fifth, which included a bottle, at 3 a.m. I don't think you realize, she tells Clint, as we all head outside to the patio, how many times I've been getting out of bed for the last three years. Sure I do. She takes a seat and looks at him skeptically. Even though you've been sleeping through it. Yep. How? Based on how much I complain about it? No, it's not just based on how much you complain. I absolutely know how much you deal with at night. But whether you'll like to hear this answer or not, it's because you wanted it this way. Angie gives him a sheepish look. Because of the whole cry it out method that I won't do? Yeah. Angie says nothing. After two years, you let me do it with this one. Clint points to Eli. And it was done in two weeks. Eli is the three-year-old. But you didn't want me to do it with this one, he gestures at Zay, who's been keeping them up all night. He ha you had your method, and I let you have your method, but that method entails getting up very, very frequently. I didn't want to be a part of that, just like you didn't want to be a part of Cry It Out. He waits. Angie is silent. Then she makes a face. I just don't think that you have the same physical response that I do to him crying. I get that internal anxiety, that physical pain, that, that guilt. I understand. It's a motherly link. You've explained that. So I could not be anywhere near it or hear it. Honestly, I would have to set up a cot downstairs in the office because emotionally, I can't deal with it. Okay. But I think it's more like you want me to endure the stuff that you've endured rather than getting it done. Now at this point, I am convinced that Angie is going to slug Clint in the jaw. I couldn't believe he said that. But she doesn't get angry. She appears to take it quite seriously, but she's not convinced. So last night, after the fifth time, would you have just let him cry it out? No, if you were paying attention, I was increasing the amount of time I waited between each time I went in, which is how cry it out works. <laughs> Again, she looks at him skeptically. Well, was it working? Yes, I mean, I didn't have a stopwatch or anything, but yes. So how come when I started asking you questions about it, you didn't tell me what you were doing. Because, says Clint, you don't want me to do the cry it out method. He looks guiltily at his toes. At least this way, you perceived it as me being really lazy and not wanting to get up. I can combat that. It was easier, in other words, for Clint to leave Angie with the impression that he was a bum than to confess that he was covertly sleep training their child. There was probably some passive aggression in that choice. But Clint also knew the process would fill Angie with anxiety and self-reproach. And the one thing Angie did not need in her life, clearly, was more anxiety and self-reproach. So he tried to sleep train Zay on the sly and then felt guilty the next day because he couldn't come clean about it. Thinking he would be judged for it, he made the executive decision that it would be better to be deemed lazy than unfeeling. But he isn't unfeeling. The way I approach this type of thing, says Clint, is the same way I run the house. If I have $2,000 and I need to spend $1,500 of it on the mortgage and $400 of it on utilities, the $100 left over is going to me so that I can maintain my sanity level. If I have two hours, it's the same thing. I get 10 minutes, regardless. And I don't take that. Clint shrugs. If I don't take that 10 minutes, the quality level of the rest is going to go downhill real quick. The uh, husband-wife research team who had the idea to do the pie charts um, has a word for this. I mean, they call it unentitlement. It's a simple word, but I, they were describing it serially when talking about mothers, the sense of unentitlement they have that they can't take those 10 minutes. Um, 
or that they can't bear to sleep train their kids, even though they will eventually, you know, get a better night's sleep. Um, I'm now going to skip ahead to the section about adolescents. Um, I didn't used to read this aloud, and then someone pointed out to me that most of the people who come to readings, because my readings are at night, tend to be people who can leave their kids at home. <laughs> so that there was probably some, you know, demand for stuff about adolescent kids. Uh, this is, I love this woman, she was amazing. Um, her name is Gail in the book. She, oh, I changed all the names of the parents of adolescents because you're dealing with serious problems for the first time and your kids are doing stuff that might be more challenging. So that's the only place where there are pseudonyms. So for our purposes, her name is Gail. What was interesting to me about adolescence generally is that it is this time when because your kid is at best kind of spending less time with you and at worst being aggressively hostile or rejecting, a lot of problems in your own life become unmasked. You know, you used to get a lot of fuel from your kid bounding up to you and think, telling you you were great. And then when that stops, you know, you're looking to other places for reinforcement. So if you don't like your friendships or your church or your synagogue or your husband or wife or your you know, your job or your boss, if you're not getting sustenance from those places, you're suddenly going to see it a lot more vividly. So that's what was most interesting to me about the adolescent years. Um, so here I am talking um, with a woman named Gail about this. Now I'm going to just say at the outset, she made a choice to stay home with her kids. I do not, uh, I have to really emphasize this, this book takes no position on whether women should work or not work. For the record, I think the mommy wars are 100% fake. I think people do what they need to do in order to make their families work. And that most things that people think are choices wind up just being things that we wind up doing because that's the way it works out best for the family. I'm only reading from her section because she has certain regrets about having stayed home for the length of time that she did because she's very poetic about it. But it does not reflect some kind of philosophy on my part, Lord knows. Um, as part of his study of the parents of adolescents, Lawrence Steinberg asked, oh, Lawrence Steinberg is the guru on this subject, an academic who knows everything, um, asked his participants to fill out midlife, a midlife rumination scale, which included this item. I find myself wishing I had the opportunity to start afresh and do things over, knowing what I do now. Nearly two thirds of the women reported frequently feeling this way. So did more than half of the men. When he wrote up the results for Crossing Paths, that's a book that he wrote about this subject, Steinberg made a, made a crucial distinction about this question. He noted that the survey item didn't ask participants whether they wanted to be teenagers again. That's the cliched wisdom, that what adults truly crave in midlife is the raucousness and freedom of their youth. Thus the cliches about men purchase, purchasing red sports cars and women running off with their tennis instructors. What Steinberg realized in follow-up interviews with his subjects was that they didn't want a second adolescence at all. What they want, Steinberg writes, is a second adulthood. Their children's adolescence, he found, was often cause for extensive in inventory taking, if not a full-scale review of their life choices. Filled with misgivings about their choice of career, spouse, or lifestyle, he writes, they want a chance at another life. This inventory taking is precisely what Gail does when I sit with her in her sunny kitchen on a Sunday morning as her three adolescent daughters, ages 14, 17, and 20, slowly start to stir. She relates a counterfactual history for, of herself, but she doesn't rewind the tape to the very beginning. She, rew she rewinds it to the moment that she left home. If I had chosen to spend more time on studying in high school, she says, I could have gone to a different college, Finish sooner, maybe been, maybe been in a different career earlier, which would have sent me on a different path. And maybe, in the scheme of my life, that would have been a better choice. Gail's choice was to be a stay-at-home mother. When she made her decision, it made perfect emotional sense. I quit working because I couldn't stand being away from my children, she says, as her girls yo-yo in and out of the kitchen. To be away for an hour, to go to the bank, just hurt me. She goes on to talk about how great it was being home with them. She loved it. Um, but then it got big, and she decided she wanted to go back and start teaching again, which is what she'd been trained to do. She was a public school teacher in New York City. Um, Gail tried to reverse course. 
For a while now, she's been looking for work as a public school teacher, the field in which she was originally trained. But trying to find a job in a sector that's, su that's suffering terrible cutbacks, at the age of 53 no less, is not easy. And the process has not exactly bo boosted her morale. If you look at any school review, she says, you see the teachers are young and energetic, which sounds great. But for me, it's a little blow. I think I'm energetic, but I'm not young. Over the years, she has been forced to reckon with the financial consequences of her decision to stay home, too. She recalls one of the road trips she took with May in her junior year, touring some of the st schools in New York State's university system. They quarreled bitterly. May thought the quality of some of these schools was so low that it was a waste of time to apply. And I was saying, you'd better, says Gail. Those colleges were all that she and her husband, who owns a small mail order business, could realistically afford. As May was growing up, Gail conveyed to her the idea that she could go to any college she wanted, so long as she worked hard enough. It was a useful illusion, one spun primarily out of love, to make May feel secure, to make her feel optimistic, to make her feel confident and powerful, and motivated in a world that in fact is sometimes scary and hard to navigate. You raise a child to think the world of possibilities is theirs, says Gail. And we somehow think, oh, we'll make enough money. Or, oh, they'll get in on a, a soccer scholarship. And then all of a sudden, they're 18. And it's like, oh, no, you can't go to college there. On that road trip, May called her mother's bluff. She assessed with a gimlet eye the limitations of the world around her and declared that she didn't like them. That was when Gail realized that this spell she'd cast, this story she had so lovingly told, was perhaps as much for her own benefit as it was for May's. We, she tells me, had been living in that dream world too. Um, I have two chapters on joy in this book, one about the joy that really, really, really little kids bring, and one on just the joy of like having raised a kid, the overall arc of a life, what it means to give love and to have purpose and to have those mysterious moments of you know, awe and transcendence. I'm going to read from the little kid section. It's very short. But I think it just encapsulates something that many people in this room might relate to. Young children may be grueling, young children may be vexing, and young children may bust and redraw the contours of their parents' professional and marital lives. But they bring joy, too. Everyone knows this hence bundles of joy. But it's worth considering some of the reasons why. It's not just because they're soft and sweet and smell like perfection. They also create wormholes in time, transporting their mothers and fathers back to feelings and sensations they haven't had since they themselves were young. The dirty secret about adulthood is the sameness of it. It's tireless adherence to routines and customs and norms. Small children may intensify the sense of repetition and rigidity by virtue of the new routines they establish but they liberate their parents from those ruts too. All of us crave liberation from those ruts. More to the point, all of us crave, li crave liberation from our adult selves, at least from time to time. I'm not just talking about the selves with public roles to play and daily obligations to meet. We can find relief from those people simply by going on vacation, or for that matter, by pouring ourselves a stiff drink. I'm talking about the selves who live too much in their heads rather than their bodies who are burdened with too much knowledge about how the world works rather than being excited about how it could or should, who are afraid of being, about the selves who are afraid of being judged and not being loved. Most adults do not live in a world of forgiveness and unconditional love, unless, that is, they have small children. The most shameful part of adult life is how blinkered it makes us, how brittle and ungenerous in our judgments. It often takes a much bigger project to make adults look outward to make them boundless and unwearied in giving, as the novelist and philosopher C.S. Lewis writes in The Four Loves. Young children can go a long way toward yanking grown-ups out of their silly preoccupations and cramped little mazes of self-interest, not just relieving their parents of their egos, but helping, aspire them to something, helping them aspire to something better. That's all I got. <laughs> Well, I think we have some time for some questions. If you, uh, if you did write down on the cards, please pass them uh, to the uh, aisle and we'll pick them up. But uh, we can go ahead and start with the brave ones who uh, want to ask their questions themselves.
you know, you, you did a lot of research, obviously, and you talked to a lot of different people. What was one of the moments uh, during that process that really struck you personally? Uh, okay, do I need to repeat the question or did everybody hear it? It was, I did a lot of research and spent time with a lot of families. What was the, mo what of those moments sort of struck me? A couple of things, okay, just from watching families, this is a very small thing, but I kept noticing that the parents of young kids who got down on their knees and were eyeball to eyeball with their kids all the time had better results than those who stood. I know that sounds insane, but you forget that being that small and that height differential is like really scary sometimes for a kid. That's just an offhand thing. It has nothing to do with anything I wrote in the book, and there's nothing prescriptive in there. I'm just telling you because you asked me what did I notice. Something that I took seriously, the same husband-wife team who did the pie charts and who did the un who talked about unentitlement, they're, they're pioneers in this field. They noticed that if couples before having a baby worked out the division of labor ahead of time in a really minute kind of way, I mean fine print way, which of course me and my husband didn't do anything of, a, of the kind. I mean, we didn't do this, but they pointed out that if you did do that, odds were you were gonna be happier in your marriage and you were gonna feel like the division was fairer. And if the men weren't doing their part, they were gonna feel like they wanted to do more. So I try and do that in an ongoing way. We like, me and my husband sort of sit down sometimes and say, here's what I got going this week. What's, what do you have going this week? What do we think is fair? <laughs> like. Let's, because fairness isn't like how a jury would adjudicate it. It's like what you think is possible and what you think is plausible and what you know is achievable. And you, you sit there and you pool it. And if you do, work it out ahead of time, rather than having a passive aggressive fight on the day of when you need to do your seven things and so does he, it's easier. <laughs> so I do that. Um, that struck me uh, a lot. I was very struck by that. The other thing I'm most struck by is that if, uh, parents who archive a lot, who take a lot of pictures, and who write down the funny stuff their kids say, they are very well positioned to do something. Uh, I, I, I'm not sentimental, and so I don't do this very much, and I've started to, because at the end of my book, I talk about the fact that, um, again, Daniel Kahneman, the Nobel Prize winner who does all this interesting work on behavioral economics and stuff, he notes that we have two selves. We have the remembering self and the experiencing self. And our experiencing self goes through life actually living life, and making and make, you know making decisions in real time, and our experiencing self, according to the data, doesn't seem to love parenting as much as it, we would want it to. It's too stressed out. Our remembering self loves parenting. If you ask people you know with children what the greatest source of joy is in their life, they all say their kids, and they will all ping right over to a memory about something phenomenal. Um, this is overwhelming, shown repeatedly in Gallup and Pew and you know, academic settings. It, it's, it's, it's just an altogether different thing. So I'm now trying to optimize my remembering self. I'm, ha I'm like archiving like mad. So that even at the end of the night, I can sit down and like rewatch videos and crack up at them and you know, look at things that my kids said that are just insane and laugh at them. Because um, I noticed the couples who were doing that were having a kind of a ball doing it, even just if their kid was napping. It was a great reminder, oh my God, you know, you can enjoy things so much better when you're about five feet away than rather when your like, nose is pressed against it. So that, you had a question, yeah. I was just wondering, on looking at the research, I'm not, you sort of made the point of excluding New York City. Yeah. We all kind of chuckled about that, because I'm sure a lot of people in Europe, friends that live in New York City, and from growing up and live up there, it's just like worlds different from the way parents raise their kids here in Houston. But did you see other differences? I mean, excluding New York City, did you see across the country in different places? Regional differences. Regional differences? Yeah, that's a great question. So like, do, did I see regional differences with parents? I mean, you know, it's funny. I think that the anxieties about um, preparedness for the future, you know, like the, the kind of extracurricular mad dash that lots of parents do, and the carpool Hades we all invo involve ourselves in, like driving hither and yon. I kind of saw that everywhere. It might have been slightly more relaxed in the Midwest. People might not have been quite as stressed out. But I have to tell you, the thing that I found surprising about Houston is that I found that parents here and in the, the suburbs could almost go toe-to-toe -to -toe with New York parents in terms of extracurricular involvements. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, I was really surprised. The emphasis might have been slightly different. 
you will not find a lot of New York parents who are like football. You know, that was, you know, and that was obviously like a very big thing here. I think that there is a lot more emphasis on sports here. There is, needless to say, a lot more space. But I was very surprised. And also, I think that you know what was interesting about Missouri City and Sugarland in particular is like demographic demographically, it's changing so much. It's not, it's now a quarter Asian, so there are now like a lot of kids who are. Um, excelling, who are, you know, like taking calculus, you know, in 10th grade, not in 11th grade, which I grew up ha in New York. That was like our world too, you know, and we took our cues from a lot of like immigrant cultures that really emphasize math and stuff. So to see it kind of like spreading out all across the United States was fascinating. In some ways, what stunned me was the similarities and not the differences, if you know what I mean. And also, can I just tell you something? It, I had a Minnesota woman banging my ear about how, Tom Friedman and how much reading the world is flat scared her. You know, the globalization that like whatever like her kid's job is going to be taken by someone in, you know, Bangla in Bangalore, which, you know, is it now a, a modern day concern? I think it well, that was what was surprising to me that like these concerns have gone kind of global and that maybe my wish to I mean I still stand by my decision to avoid mainly New York, but yes. Yeah. Yep. Split yep. And blended families. Blended, I wish I'd done. I didn't. Single parent families, I did. In fact, it's in the Houston chapter, a great deal of it. Um, I followed single mothers. Um, I have a single father um, in <coughs> the adolescence chapter who talks very poignantly about this. Single parents, um, what the data show is not surprising. They're less happy than married parents. They have tw twice as much responsibilities and half the resources. In fact, if they're women, you usually have less than half the resources financially. You take a big hit, yeah. So I talk about that. Also, they have less free time, stands to reason. Their, so their social networks are smaller, it's hard. In the adolescent years, there are these challenges uh, in terms of, you know, there's a lot of projecting going on in the adolescent years where your kid, you can't tell if they're a grown up or if they're a child. And the mistake that parents sometimes make is recruiting kids into their arguments or looking at the kid and saying, look, my son's lazy just the way you're lazy. Why don't you do, you know, and that can be very problematic. So I do talk about it. Um, you know, uh, you do develop like a distinct relationship with your kid when you're a single parent. You know, it's very intense and it can be very close. Um, it can go every which way. But the research itself tends to skew in, in a way that it wants to look at the toll it takes. So it's hard in some ways to get like a full, in fact, I have several single women in my Houston chapter, now that I think about it. Um, but you know, the research, it has this kind of like implicit, they want to understand the hardships. So you know, it's unfortunately, if I wanted to also write about what some of the like say benefits were of having this unique kind of dyad relationship, if it's just you and one kid or you and two kids, like, you'd be hard-pressed to find that kind of stuff out there, I hate to say. Yeah? Did you look at all that parenting children with special needs? No. And I, there's a well-developed body of literature out there on that, and it's great, and I would have. But I knew that Andrew Solomon was writing Far From the Tree at the exact same time that I was writing this book, and that he was writing a 900-page book on this very subject. <laughs> and I, because I was aiming for the middle of the middle of the bell curve, I just thought, I mean, on the one hand, it feels remiss of me, and I wish that I had, not least because special needs kids aren't actually outside the bell curve, they're in it. Every, I mean, tons of families we know have it. But at the same time, I thought, there is a comprehensive, beautiful book that's, I think it had already rolled out when I was cleaning up my, when I was, you know, at the end stage of writing. And I just had to make a choice about this. Like, it is such a huge topic. And there are so many different kinds of special needs kids, as Andrew pointed out. I mean, and each special needs family is so idiosyncratic, and each, you know, deafness is different from dwarfism, is different from, you know, um, having a kid who's, uh, you know, been arrested for something really terrible, different from a kid who has multiple disabilities and an IQ of only 25. I it just, I didn't know how I could kind of mush all that into one. Yeah. 
Totally. I mean, and like I said, it might have been remiss on my part, but I, I also knew that Andrew was co covering some of that. So I just, I had to make an executive choice because there were so many different ways to go on that question. I do have one very special example of a 67-year-old woman who is taking care of her three-year-old grandson because her daughter died. And that is the one kind of very unusual case study that I have in here about the unique joys that like even though she was in this extreme situation, that she was deriving unbelievable pleasure from this and unbelievable meaning and purpose. So I did do that. But no, I didn't do that. For better or for worse. Uh, I guess. Oh, yeah. Not yet, and it's a great question. And also, you know, there's now a, a big look at kind of helicopter parenting and whether you know spending too much time with your kids backfires. I'm sure you've all seen this. You know, there's um, lots of anxieties about that. That kids show up under constructed when they're you know at uh, schools. And in terms of like the ramp up and the hyper scheduling and the like, how much do you have to do? Well, so, you know, when I was in high school, I was told it was really important to study Japanese, and that if I didn't study Japanese, I would be up a creek without a paddle. And with all due respect to the Japanese, that did not happen. So now everybody thinks they've got to teach their kids Mandarin. And it seems really important this minute. Like right now, that seems very important. But we don't know what will be important, and I'm always trying to stress this. I mean, my favorite thing is sort of, Watch an old episode of Star Trek. Their attempt to attempts to imagine the future are so hilariously encumbered by what the present actually looks like that you realize they're really hobbled imaginatively in this case. So I don't know what to say. I mean, I wish I had better data on this and whether it, does it actually. And you know, the best here is something that I think is really interesting that you would probably like. So Annette Larue, who wrote Unequal Childhoods, looks at lower income families and you know, families with more means, the overscheduled families versus the ones that are not especially aggressively scheduled. And she points out she has no idea whether the outcomes would be any different at all if those parents weren't aggressively scheduling their kids. It could just be that having a financial leg up and having parents who like to read and having a safe neighborhood could be the, the, the biggest indicator and driver. You know what I mean? So it's hard to, I wish I knew. I would give like many, 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 many dollars to know the answer to that question. <laughs> well, we have time maybe for one more question. I have somebody referring to it as non-calorie chocolate. It's all upside. The problem is that there is less grandparenting literature out there than I'd like, but everybody tells me the same thing. It's all worth it because the grandkids are the best. And yeah. Is I that hope so. <laughs> it totally needs to be repeated. It's all joy and all fun. You can yeah, you hand them back off, right? Yeah. 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 Well, I want to thank you very much for the pleasure of coming, and uh, we really appreciate it.